next day and be like, God, I can feel more capillaries in my legs. Or, you know, got, I can feel this more light coming through, just like pulsating inside me. You know, it's not, it's not an instant like process like that. It's more like a steady grind. And, and how I like to think of it is, to feel my rides, I, I buy these big five kilogram bags of maltodextrin. And uh, it, when I first get it, I think this bag is just huge. Like, this is going to last forever. But I know that, you know, I put my scoops in and, and just, you know, pick up the scoops a day uh, for, for my ride. And, and, you know, eventually I get through that bag. And I know that bag represents me having done around 100 hours of riding. And actually, you know, by the time I've done 100 hours of riding, I will have more mitochondria. You know, I will have more capillaries. And, and so it's like, you don't notice it day on day. But you know, you can chip away at it like a dripping tap, and eventually, you know, the climb that you're getting dropped on last year, you're dropping people on, and you think of it as like a piggy bank, you just put a coin in every day, and that's you know, both each time you sleep, each time you train, each time you eat, it's all just making this triangle, pulling it out, pulling it out in all directions. So then you've established that you need to be doing these things. And you need to be doing them not just on a one-off, you need to be doing them day after day after day and you get this cumulative effect. So then the important word then becomes consistency. How can you be consistent doing these things? So I'll break that down firstly into two, two of the main components, which I historically perhaps haven't been so good at. That's not getting ill and not getting injured. So how, how, what the things I try to look at um, with, with focus on with not getting ill, first of all, is, um, you know, I'm sure you're all particularly aware at the moment of, uh, you know, not getting, of, uh, yeah, your immunity and, um, and and not putting yourself in high risk situations. And I think particularly high risk situations when you've finished either a long, a long ride or a high intensity ride, your immunity then, so that's your protection against, you know, harmful viruses, similar to something like the I've paid us that once it's similar to like you know a man old 90 year old woman you know it's you really really don't have much protection when you're in that state when your glycogen depletes the state in a long ride or a hard session so I, I i when planning your training if you if you're trying to get a session done tightly say before you've got to go to a lecture just just plan it so that you don't do that because you know fitting in that session then that tightly but that means you get ill because you catch COVID at your lecture or catch COVID at your party, you miss a week's training, it's not worth it. So that three hour window, I think particularly at this time of year is really important. Um, then generally having a good diet, making sure, you know, with plenty of fiber to keep your gut health well, probiotics to improve, you know, that improves your immunity, just getting, making sure you're getting all the vitamins and minerals. Um, you know, that's really important and then also just like managing your training load not shooting for a training load that is too difficult that is too that is too soon you know like you wouldn't go in the gym and suddenly start trying to bench press 200 kilos if you've never done more than 50 before so don't try and do 20 hours if you never do more than five hours a week on the bike and then as for uh not getting injured i think the key things to not getting injured First of all, you know, making sure you're eating enough, fueling enough, and then equally uh, doing strength and conditioning work, you know, getting in the gym, making sure you're stronger. The stronger you are, the less likely you are to break down. And then again, the recurring theme of not doing too much too soon with your training load. Don't, don't spike it too much too quickly. Again, like use progressive overload, just like, yeah, the analogy with if you go in the gym, you know, just put on a little bit more on the bar each week. You don't go from zero to hero in a month. Um, and then a few other things I find is just like, um, just try and keep that that mental like balance as well and, and keep your men on top of your mental health. You know, make sure you just take time to see your friends, spend time with your friends and family, spend less time on social media. You know, on my wall now I've got, I've got a, Post that I've just written myself, and I said, "Social media is dangerous. It costs you what?" So, 
schools. Um, and equally, I find a lot of benefit from um, doing meditation. And I'm like, you can laugh all you want, but if you can think of all the things you can do, it, it might, you know, may or may not help your cycling performance. I strongly believe it does. But not only does it help your cycling performance, but it helps every aspect of your life. For me personally, I find it makes me happier, it makes me calmer, it makes me a better person, better relationships with my friends and family. And so I couldn't highly, I couldn't recommend it enough that you, that you look into some breath work and meditation. Um, one last little incidental thing is I think uh, a lot of people don't value having a training bike. Um, I think before you spend money on getting some carbon wheels or some upgrade, just have a bike that you can have as a, you know, just for training. It doesn't, no one cares if you're going 14 miles an hour or 24 miles an hour on your endurance rides. Speed doesn't matter, just have a bike. So you've always got one bike. So if one breaks, you can still go out on the other one. So you're not losing a week for training because you're waiting for a new bottom bracket or something like that. Um, so that's that specific to cycling. So moving to the next area of the triangle now. That's uh, so yeah, just the summary summation of this slide is health is the foundation for your endurance performance, and that's what's going to help you be consistent over time. So um, yeah, moving on to the next area of the triangle is is sleep, and um, so yeah, sleep. Just like I said, uh, with um, your training and nutrition, sleep is something that you also want to look to. You know, can I sleep more? Can I get more hours of sleep in? Can I make my sleep of better quality? Um, one thing that's part of my routine that works for me is uh, as it gets to the evenings, I swing these red glasses on. Is um, they block out the blue light, um, which is, you know, you can go and look at the research if you want, but um, it's sort of blue light, um, it's kind of like, you know, your sunrise, and then that, you know, your body's natural circadian rhythm is such that the blue light means, you know, be awake now, it's daytime, and then when that, you know, that comes off, you know, it's dark, and you get the melatonin kicks in, which helps you sleep. So, um, yeah, I feel like they work. Um, so that's just just trying to illustrate there that you know, just like I, I emphasize um, the importance of sleep. But some other big important things with sleep are um, not having caffeine late in the day, um, not training, especially high intensity exercise. Obviously, sometimes you're on a race in the evening, but you know, even if you know, even if you can. Just, just try not to do, especially anything high intensity in the evening. Try not to eat too late at night. Again, especially don't go on social, don't spend time on social media on your phone well into the evening. Um, what I find for me is I like to just really not do anything simulating too close to bed. Um, and I, I find yoga yeah, and doing some yoga, stretching, meditation really helps me calm down. Um, and then just be keeping a, a consistent routine of when you wake up, when you go to bed, you know, just, just trying to keep that as consistent as you possibly can really helps. Um, this study here, I just wanted to, just as a pin, just something to illustrate how important sleep is, is um, so there were two groups, and they, these, were, these were men doing some resistance training exercise. They were all doing the same training, the same training in the gym. And they're all on the same same diet, you know, those same macronutrients. So um, they're all eating the same thing. So the only variable that's different between the groups was one was getting full eight plus hours of sleep at night, and the other group was sleep restricted. And what they found is the group that was getting their sleep, they gained muscle and they lost fat over this period. The exact the group on the exact the other group with the sleep restriction. They, they have experienced muscle atrophy, they lost muscle, and they gained fat mass. And so that shows the perfect illustration of how you know, you're putting in all the work with your training and your nutrition, if you're not doing the sleep, you're not going to get the results. It's as simple as that. Um, so, so on fueling, and you say, I've, I've got quite, I'm, I'm not a qualified nutritionist, so I'm not going to go too much into the weeds of this. 
but all I'm going to say is I feel really passionately about you know spreading the message that it's so important to fuel your training and to eat enough. Like if you're putting in all that hard work, if you're doing everything you can to optimize your sleep, if you're putting in the hours on the bike, don't cheat yourself by not eating enough and thinking you can get a small gain by getting a little bit lighter. You know, it's most of the time, if you want to get the correct adaptations from your training, you need to be eating enough to do that training, not only enough to do that training, but to recover from that training. And if you think, think, think about what you're trying to achieve with your training, like you said, you're trying to change your physiology, drive changes. If you don't have the raw materials, which are only going to come from food, how is that ever going to happen? You know, it's physics, you can't make something out of nothing. Um, you know, I've, I, I personally, I regret, you know, times in the past that I have underfueled. And it's like, I can't get that time back now. I put in all that work, you know, and at times I was getting slower because I just wasn't eating enough. And if I can shortcut anyone in this room's learning curve today, it would be just like, if in doubt, just eat more. You know, it's like, just don't take the risk with underfueling. Um, so like there's 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 the, the case of underfueling as in like generally not eating enough for weight loss and causing weight loss, or there's you know not eating enough specific carbohydrate around your key training sessions. And that's something that I found I did wrong in the past for a previous injury. And since then I've been fueling focusing on my carbohydrate intake. And I've gotten back to where I was and in excess of it much quicker than I thought would ever be possible. So if I'd say like take away from this slide would just be eat more, particularly more carbohydrate, pedal harder, you know, and that'll give you better results. Um, so yeah, so when we're thinking about with the training we're gonna do, like what what are we what we actually trying to achieve, you know, with why why are we riding our bikes, what pick a training session, like you know, what, what what's the objective of that? What what do you think we're trying to change? Was there any any ideas why why would you go and ride your bike for four hours on a Sunday? Any guesses? Any ideas? What 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 are we trying to change so we're just I mean I, I'm not saying you need to understand in, entirely. You know, some people don't like to embrace the, the science of physiology particularly. But I find for myself it's particularly motivating to think about, you know, why why am I doing this training session, even if it is just an endurance ride. You know, some things that I'd, I'd suggest if you have the time going away and have a look at them. So like such a mitochondrial biogenesis is growing, you know, growing more um, growing more mitochondria and these type of cells that produce energy, you know, growing more capillaries, that's what you know, provides blood to your muscles. You all have heard of EPO that people used to dope with, that's a, a hormone that makes you grow more red blood cells, which again is you know, to do with oxygen delivery to your working muscles. Um, a short term thing that you'll notice if you start training after a break is um, you, you, you actually you get more, more blood. Um, just, you know, that's just, so, you know, you, you experience the opposite of that when you're dehydrated. You'll notice that um, your, your plasma, your blood volume decreases, so your heart has to pump harder to get, to get that oxygen around your body. Um, so, I want, that's my takeaway here is, is, is it's real, like, biology, you're kind of dealing with, with this stuff. And so it's not sensitive to, like, in a sense to like you know, my new shy of like you know an interval training session design. It's it's it's, it's you know developed over hundreds of millions of years and it doesn't care about what training program you're following, you know, or who your coach is, things like that. Um, so moving on. So what what do we actually know about training physiology? I'd say in some ways we know a lot, and in some ways you know, there's there's a very limited points that are actually sort of defined. Um, so quickly I'll brush over. We've got two. Um, have any of you heard of the three zone model? 
Yeah, or did you only use different training zone models? You might use five or six. 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 Six, yeah. So the reason we use a three zone model in, in a LCA, for example, is these uh, we, have, we have zone one, zone two, three, and the upper end limit of your zone one is what we call your first lactate threshold. And I'd say, if anything, this is the most important lactate threshold for me you could almost have if you would simplify it further you could have a two zone model um so the first lactate threshold is is the point at which you just start producing more lactate than you are right now so at rest so anything below that and you know theoretically you can keep on forever um you're training uh the second lactate threshold is what denotes the end of your zone two and the start of your zone three and that's when your your blood lactate starts accumulating just exponentially. So it's just going to keep on going up and up when you're in your zone three. So what we most for most people most of the time we try and have a, a polarized people talk about having a polarized distribution, which is where you spend near most of your time in this zone one, or next to no time in your zone two, and, and a small but like concentrated time in the zone three. I think that's in some ways oversimplified, but what is clear and clear is that training volume is really important. This has been shown in studies with rat, you know, animals, mice, right through to elite athletes, recreationally trained athletes. There's, that's the one thing, most clear thing in, in, in research is that increasing your training volume steadily over time is going to increase performance. And that's, that's not a quick gain, like I said, it's not, you know, in, in a month. You know, it might not make that much difference, but looking longitudinally, many months and years, increasing the training volume is going to make a big difference. Um, so yeah, just training volume, good training intensity distribution, I'm polarizing pyramidal, and doing yeah, some high intensity training is uh, takeaways there. So um, I'm going. I'm not going to go in too much into the the weeds of critical power and W prime. Um, but it's just kind of an interesting model to think about. This is your, your anaerobic work capacity is, is like kind of like a turbo, and you can you can dig into that. Um, but once once it's gone, it's gone until you go um, below your critical power again, which is like you said your second lactate threshold. And so when you're designing interval sessions or when you're in a race, you can kind of think of this. You know, it's like a computer game, like. I can press my booster now and I can give it a boost. But then you know you've got to once you've used that up, you've got to wait a while before you can do it again. And using your W prime, your anaerobic, you know, power, your turbo, that's each time you do that, you're also using your carbohydrate stores. And your carbohydrate are only you, know, you can only carry something around like depending on the person, something like two thousand calories of carbohydrate. Whereas your fat stores, which is more predominantly your energy source when you're exercising below your critical power, that's, you know, you've all got enough energy to run to the lines edge to the roads with that. So that's not limited. So when you're both in your racing and your training, you've got to carefully think, when am I going to put in these? When, when can I use these, uh, these bursts, you know, this turbo? Because it's, it's, it's only really got a fire in my So, next slide. so um, don't read too much into anything below here. Um, I didn't think too much when I just slung this together, but I just thought that my key takeaway from this example plan, something up, for example, for winter, over this winter, I'll, I'll be doing something similar to this. This was something I was thinking of for myself. But my key takeaway is training doesn't have, especially going into winter, does not have to be complicated. You know, a lot of coaches they'll put they might put two hour endurance ride with zone three intervals and cadence 60 minute rpm for one minute and bursts at this and that power and you've got to think like what are you actually trying to achieve here you know again back to you're trying to manipulate basic biology that is developed from like you know cells through to cavemen through to us and that doesn't care about complex stuff like that you're just trying to stress physiological systems by getting large volume of, of time in, 
below your first lactate threshold. So basically, what we've got here, one hour endurance ride, two hour endurance ride, five hour endurance ride, two hour endurance ride, four hour, four hour, you know, it's, it's not complicated. It doesn't have to be, and in my opinion, it shouldn't be. So we've stressed from that last slide that your endurance rides are really very important. And I think back to the maximal versus minimal gains debate, like people will stress a lot about their interval sessions and I'll take them really seriously. I'm going to have my caffeine, I'm going to get psyched up and you know, I'm going to get a coach who's going to give me the best like, you know, plan of my interval training sessions. But actually the high intensity stuff, that's only a you know, 5, 10% on top. 90% of your fitness is going to come from this low intensity work. So why would you not take that in fact much more seriously? So a few things uh, I think when you're doing these uh, endurance rides is first of all make sure they are endurance rides. Stay below your first lactate thresholds and don't throw in you know, random surges just to break up the time or just for fun like some people enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another thing is, a lot of people I find don't enjoy long rides, and I think a lot of it is because they're just not fueling for it. They might barely have anything for breakfast, they won't take any carbohydrates with them on that ride, and equally they could be getting their, food, their hydration wrong. You know, that no one is happy when they're really hungry and thirsty, and you know, that's a situation you put yourself in for if you're not having a big breakfast before, you're not eating on and drinking on in drugs, right? Of course, you're not going to enjoy our four, five, or five hour ride. You know, so I think just if, if, if you think that's you and, you and you also think you don't enjoy long rides, try eating and drinking more around them. And I guarantee you, if you don't start to enjoy them a lot, you'll enjoy them more. Um, so, yeah, and more perhaps marginal gains. If having caffeine stops, it really does help you with your motivation to do endurance rides, you know, then go ahead. But if you really want to get the most out of them, then really keep the amount of time you stopped for at an absolute minimum. So you know, even if I just stop for a stop for a week, I don't think of it, it's, it's not like this, it's more like an F1 pit stop, <laughs> the side of it, and then I'm off. So there's yeah, so just keep keep the stops to a minimal. Um, so here's a contra a statement uh, that what is could be perceived from the outside is that you know after what I've said to you here you think oh just being a cyclist is about being really good at doing the same boring shit day after day. You know another four hour ride at 200 watts, you know another massive bowl of rice, you know another nine hours sleep. You know it's like it, it looks from the outside like you're just doing same boring shit day after day. Um, but that's not how I look at it. So, you know, I think if when you do a five hour ride, you're thinking, just go, oh, bloody hell, it's another hour, just, just get through it, you know, oh, this bowl of rice, bloody hell, I can't, you know, I can't finish this. You know, I, 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 I don't think of it like that. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm doing this five hour ride to get it done. I think I'm doing it to do it, you know. I'm just this is this is what I want to be doing. The reason I, you know, and I'll blatantly put up my ambition out that I want to be a professional cyclist. And the reason I want to be a professional cyclist is because I want to be able to just go and ride my bike for five or six hours every day. So that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy being in the moment, out on the roads, you know, just just me and my bike. I ride on my own a lot of the time. I never listen to music. You know, I just love the process of being out there. For me, it's the ultimate form of meditation. Um, and that's, yeah, that's why I love it. So this is a quote from a Vietnamese Buddhist monk called Thang Nhat Thang. And uh, so yeah, do not wash the dishes in order to get them clean. Wash them in order to wash the dishes. And so like I say, that trend, if you try and, if you can live every, your life, all of your life like that, anything, just don't do stuff just to get it over and done with just you know, live in the now and enjoy the process. So yeah, and ultimately cycling, remember, whether you want to be a professional cyclist or whether you're just seeing it as something to improve your, your fitness, 
cycling is a tool for health, happiness and longevity. And when you think about it, what else really matters? Anyone? Does anything else matter than health, happiness and longevity? So if you're doing cycling and it's not making you healthier, happier and making you live longer, you're doing it wrong or you know you shouldn't be doing it at all. And so yeah, you can follow me from on Instagram, uh, Strava, and I've made some YouTube videos in 2020, which are a bit of crap, but you might find most entertaining. So I'll open that up to any questions. And so I'd I'd say one at least one day a week, make sure it's like a complete rest day. Um so like you know you just don't touch your bike. And I think that's really important for like a mental reset. If you notice on that that yeah, I'd I'd have two like recovery days a week, one of which is completely off. And the other one I do just a short ride of anything between half an hour and an hour and a half. And I think you'll see some coaches that talk about like a recovery zone and like an endurance zone. Whereas you think like but if you ride at like recovery power for six hours, it's not a recovery ride, is it? So you've always got to like tie in the duration and intensity because they're intertwined. So basically on yeah, a recovery day it's just a short endurance ride. You know, so then, I hope that's easy question. Yeah. Okay. Where do you get a five-liter amount of water to extra from? <laughs> they are seven you drink. Where do you put the drinks? Yes, yes. So um, the, it comes up using my uni days student discount. Yeah. Um, I get them from my protein and they're about to end up like seven pounds or seven fifty. And then get some kitchen scales and then uh, I'd suggest yeah, if you're new to eating a part high you ride, start off with 50 grams per hour. And so just, yeah, way higher with the eating the water. Um, so, yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Does the quality of the nutrition matter? Like, could you, do you need to have, like, sports bars, sports gels, level? Can you have any food to feel you? So are you talking about whilst you're on the bike or whilst, yeah, whilst you're on the bike? Um, so what I'd be concerned about when you're on the bike, all that really matters is the grams of carbohydrate that you're having. And so there's there's only so much that your gut can absorb per hour. Um, so you don't want to be having too uh, you don't want to be overly ambitious with that. But what you'll find is most amateur riders particularly aren't having anywhere near enough. For example, I just when I used to think, oh, I'll just take some you know, bar stains, bar or some you know, eat natural bar or something, and realise I was actually up inadvertently doing you know, multiple for five hour rides and around 20 grams of carbs an hour. So just look at what you're having, and yes, yeah, say like sweets, haribos, something like that, sugar. Or one thing I use is, um, you know, like jelly, like the cubes that you don't melt, so actually make into a jelly. Just that, that's really great. Like, that's got 100 grams of carbs in it. So yeah, you don't you don't want it to be like new. If your question is, does it need to be healthy or like nutrient dense when you're riding? I'd say no. Um, hydrate density and having fat, protein, and fiber is only going to slow down your absorption of those uh, carbohydrates. And also, you know, you look at like more expensive like health product bars. You know, well, they, they are more expensive. And so you're not going to be able to buy lots of them to eat enough to do it day after day after day. I think that's the question. Thank you. Um, increasing train load. Yeah. So if you're going from something like a seven hour week and mm -hmm. you wanted to push that up to say 12 hours or something like that. Yeah. Um, what time scale are you looking at and, and how, how do you approach that? Like, and stuff. Okay, so your question is you're, you're training around seven hours a week. Yeah, so and you want to increase that to say 12 hours a week. Same so, up, yeah, 12 hours a week. Okay, so I, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's a little bit individual, 
And here's somewhere where you have to be really honest and kind of in tune with your body and kind of your subjective measures of how do I feel. And I've looked a lot into like it depends a bit on your your phenotype. So for like whether you're fast or slow twitch, strong and puffy, which everyone is on the spectrum too. So some people find that they'll benefit a lot more from you know just really slowly building it up. So say you know one week might be seven hours, and then it goes seven and a half, and then eight, and then eight and a half, over a longer period of time before taking a recovery week when they drop their volume and they're increasing again. Or some people who are more fast, slow twitch jogger might be able to do more aggressive ramp, shorter ramp for a better recovery period and cycling it like that. So um, think yeah, so think about what type of athlete you are, experiment a bit. But the key important thing is, is that you've got this progressive overload and then you take a recovery period. And when you take that recovery period, you know, err on the side of doing too little and just allow yourself to fully reset all these cells to recover, everything to rebuild, get fresh again, and then start building back up again. <laughs> so that's the bad. There's a lot, a lot of things like in coaching, training, physiology, there isn't a definite answer. Yeah, and if any coach says to you, I know this is the answer, that you know, everyone is just making their best guess. Some people have more science behind, you know, they've looked at into all sides behind it. But if anyone tells you they know the answer, just just discard them because everyone is just making their best guess. Any other questions? Would you recommend uh, warming up before a long ride, or is it just you get on the bike and then slowly build up to it, or would you do like stretches and exercises beforehand? So this is before the endurance ride. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I find a lot of benefit from doing um, just some like light mobility work, um, just to like you know, uh, loosen everything off a bit, and then also particularly like um, glute activation. I find that that makes me feel a lot better on the bike um, and that's another thing that helps to reduce your risk of injuries by encouraging better lots of firing patterns. Um, anything else? Any questions? Anyone that's questions from the on teams? No, there's nothing on that. So. <coughs> all good? Any other questions? Are we all good? Yeah, all good. Very nice. All right, thank you very much for coming today. I was yeah, really enjoyed the event. I hope some of you learned something that was useful. No, quality. Cheers, Manus. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Cool. So, well, for everyone on, online and in the room, um, all but two of you are development. So, if 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 you're not in development, you're feel free to go. Um, but if not, you're happy to hang around. So, what we'll do now is we'll go through the session for Saturday. Um, You've all had this email before, hopefully, um, with the atta uh, document attached. Um, but we'll just go for it in person now, just while we're all here. So we're good to go on Saturday and we can get going. Um, let me just find it. And then we'll share my screen as well. Cool. So yeah, session plan for Saturday. We're going to Leicester Cycle Circuit. Um, hands up if you have been there before. Cool. Um, so for those of you who haven't been there before, it's a pretty simple and basic circuit. Um, it's sort of like an extended kidney shape. There's no sort of sharp corners in it. There's sort of two, two squat, wide sweeping corners in it. Um, but yeah, we'll head there. It's about a 45 minute to 50 minute ride away. Um, we'll do this for one or two hours and then we'll ride home. Um, and it's also, yeah, it's just part of the selection process for development. Uh, your applications count as well. What have you done before in the previous years? Account, uh, if you were on development, count as well. But if you're not, please don't worry. Um, it's just a chance to see you ride and, yeah, how you're on the bike, basically. Um, so, yeah, we'll go to Leicester Cycle Circuit, which is at this address. And there's also a Strava link there how, on how to get there. So if you do have a Garmin or Wahoo, or whatever, please put that route in help you get there and back. Uh, so what we'll do, the session's between 12, uh, 10 and 12. So we'll rock up at the fountain for 8.50 and make sure we leave by nine. 
Um, it just gives us a nice hour, easy to get over there. Um, following that Strava route there. We'll get there for nine. Um, hopefully it'll be nice and sunny and we can drop layers and kit at the side. Uh, and then just yeah, have a bit of a, have a bit of a chat and a, a rider briefing as as to yeah what the circuit's like and what to expect during it. So from ten to the, the session, well, the two hours will split, be split up into an hour each. Um, ten to ten to eleven and then eleven to twelve. Session one is for everyone who's ridden over. We've got this from half past. Have you? Yeah. Cool. Can you give us five minutes or not? Uh, can we make it like two? Two, yeah, perfect. So from 10 to 11 is going to be tier A and B. So everyone who's turned up will ride that hour. Uh, it basically is simple skills and techniques um, on the bike just to see how everyone's riding. Um, a range of abilities will be at a session. So we might split up groups depending on abilities. Um, and then, so that, that first hour will look like, where are we? Yeah, so the first hour will be a bit of warm up group riding skills. Um, a bit of figure eight sort of bike handling type type skills um, just to see how you're on the bike and then when you're if you're applied to tier b so anyone who's not applied to the one-to-one -one coaching will um, do a three three laps all out just to have a time and something qualitative uh, quantitative to sort of compare you against um, but just just to do your best on that then tier b you're welcome to go home um, the second hour will be for Tier A or invite only. Um, this will be more of more race simulations, sort of a I'm gonna say a higher level of cycling of, in terms of like race simulations and race orientation. Um, so there'll be the same thing as you guys did on the LCA selection, which is 10 lap uh, time trial, which is a segment on Strava, which can be found at that link. Um, it'll be your fastest 10 laps around the circuit. You'll be in charge of counting the number of laps you do and also recording it. Uh, if you don't have a Garmin or Wahoo, or whatever. Um, I can help you out on the day, that's not a problem, but please do bring it. Then we'll have a bit of a rest and then depending on time, we'll do a, some sort of race simulation, um, depending on ability, number of riders there and everything else. And that is it. Um, yeah, time to go, I think. But all that information is there. Uh, I hope to see you on Saturday, 10, yeah, 10 to 9 in the morning. Um, and we'll ride over there and just have a bit of fun with it, meet everyone. And uh, yeah, any questions on that? Perfect. Cheers, guys. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, it means a lot. Um, yeah, we'll hopefully, hopefully go cycling this year and um, everything else like that. So any questions, you can catch me outside. Um, if not, have a good evening and I'll see you Saturday.